Uh, good morning, everyone. So welcome uh, to do today's session. So it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Frank Kilisha from the Max Planck Institute for the Physics of Complex Systems in Dresden, in Germany. Uh, Frank is a first-rate physicist, but who has made forays into very deep problems in biology and has really made uh, biological physics shine in, in, in Dresden. So being there, I know Dresden is really a mecca for biophysics. So Frank. Yeah, thank you very much, EJ. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be back here um, at ICTS and um, to give some lectures on active surfaces. So um, what I want to do in these two lectures is first give you um, sort of motivation um, into the physics of active matter in cells and tissues, and highlight in particular the fact that um, active processes at surfaces play a particular role um, for the dynamics and for shaping cells and tissues. And I will therefore use some time to introduce some concepts to describe active surfaces. Is this better? <laughs> so I will use some time to describe concepts um, to uh, capture the physics of active surfaces, their geometry, and their dynamics. Um, so my, my group is um, interested um, in the physics um, of cells and tissues at different scales, starting from how um, molecules collective organize cellular processes um, to understand cellular substructures, spatial organization of cells, and the dynamics of cellular processes, and then eventually on larger scales, how many cells collectively um, organize in space and time to form tissues. I'd like to start out with some acknowledgments. So we've been collaborating with many colleagues um, that we have in Dresden. Um, an intense collaboration between two Max Planck Institutes. Um, our institute, the MPI for the Physics of Complex Systems, and the MPI of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics. Um, both in Dresden, we have built a joint research program bridging between physics and biology. Um, we've um, created a center for systems biology, which is a joint operation that serves as a hub for collaborations. Um, and in recent years, we also have established, together with the university, the Cluster of Excellence Physics of Life. So we have now quite a broad environment there. And we've been interested in, in, in active surfaces now for quite some time, um, particularly in collaboration with Guillaume Salbreu and with Stefan Grill. Um, I'd like to highlight, in particular, Alexander Mietke, a former PhD student who is now in Oxford. Um, currently, Jonas Neipel is working on problems around, uh, around active surfaces, also um, in the group of Christina Kutztal, Akil Varma. Um, and this work um, has been done uh, for quite some time now in collaboration with Vijay, um, who is here. So as a rough outline of my talk, um, I will first sort of motivate active metaphysics in cells and tissues, um, and we'll then go into um, more concepts um, of how to describe the geometry and dynamics of shapes and surfaces. So uh, one general motivation in biology is that during morphogenesis um, of a fertilized egg, which then divides generates many cells. These cells change their properties and types, um, move, organize in space, and generate complex patterns, morphologies, shapes, structures, when they build tissues and organs and organisms. And the uh, fundamental question is to understand how shapes are generated. So that's what the term morphogenesis means. And generating shape is fundamentally active dynamic process 
that involves geometry. So it combines the physics of active materials with geometry. Now, an example of morphogenesis uh, shown here is, stems from the study of the fruit fly and its um, tissue development. An important model system is the wing of the fly. Um, so here you see a precursor early um, fly wing in the pupa of a developing fly um, with a fluorescent label um, that highlights the membranes of the cells. So these are you see here the outlines of a large number of cells. And this is a two-dimensional um, tissue. It's a sheet of cells. It is now tracked over 17 hours um, in a time-lapse movie to illustrate of the dynamics of such a system. And that gives rise to um, the morphology of a, a fly wing. So after that process, the fly wing is ready. And when the fly emerges from the pupa, it can um, use its wings to fly. And you see here that this is a dynamic material that is collectively formed by many cells. It's active, it generates flows. Um, you see cell divisions when cells divide, they round up, and you see this little dark circular spots. Um, you can see the veins forming and the shape changing. This is a rather simple system because it's two dimensional and it is flat, it doesn't bend yet in the third dimension, but um, is an example of morphogenesis. Now, um, complex dynamics of, of active matter can also be seen at a cell scale. And also there, you often have surfaces that are active. So here you see um, a fertilized cell, fertilized egg cell of the warm sea elegans, which is about to undergo its very first cell division. And under the microscope, you see the dynamics of the system. There's a lot of motion. Um, there are shape changes. It's a liquid-like system, um, and there are flows generated. And one of the reasons that this cell shows such a strong um, movement and, and, and flow dynamics is that this cell divides asymmetrically. There's a broken symmetry. That's the warm, the elegance. It is a hermaphrodite that can self-fertilize. And then it lays these fertilized eggs. And the very first division of this um, merging embryo uh, is asymmetric. It generates two cells of different size. Um, and this symmetry breaking already somehow sets the difference to head and a future tail um, of this organism. So this is a fundamental symmetry breaking um, um, that is biologically um, of high importance, and that is realized at the scale of a cell that becomes spatially asymmetric. And because of this asymmetry, there are also movements that are directed, and that's why you see so strong flows. That's what the cell asymmetry looks like when you label particular molecules fluorescently, so-called paraproteins, that form domains in the cell membrane. Um, the two different molecules are labeled and you see two distinct um, domains. This polarity of the cell, once established, organizes spatially asymmetric processes that then distribute during cell division material unequally between the two daughter cells that also have different size. Now this polarity is established in an active process um, that is driven by the surface. Um, so surface flows help establish these domains and these surface flows then also drive bulk flows um, inside the cell. That's why under the microscope you see all these movements. So cytoplasmic flows. Now this process um, is sort of shown here. The system starts out non-polar. So the membrane is rich in one of these par proteins. So there's one domain covering 
the whole surface. The sperm entry somehow provides a local perturbation that triggers the symmetry breaking. It weakens the region of the cell surface and the remaining contractile surface then pulls material in, these flows with contraction. And then this, do this domain, which used to cover the whole surface, now only remains on one half, and the second domain forms in green. And this process is a patterning process that is also mechanical or mechanochemical in nature. So our picture is that we have um, as a paradigm for the generation of patterns in cells and also in, often in tissues, is that these processes are fundamentally mechanochemical, that you have force generating processes which are regulated by biochemistry, but that the force generation gives rise to movements and flows that feed back on the chemistry. So we have such a feedback. Force generation drives flows, which then reposition and, and reorganize chemical signals, and the chemical signals themselves coordinate and activate force generation. Now, key here is this mechanical activity, the contractility, um, in this case of this of an active gel below the cell membrane. So, so the surface of the cell is an active system that drives these processes. There's a thin layer of a cytoskeletal network made by actin filaments, which are labeled here in red. This is from Stefan Grill's lab. Um, it's a high-resolution optical microscopy, which shows both myosin motors in green and filaments in red. And together, they form an active material that is contractile. And it's essentially a two-dimensional sheet. So it's a surface-like material. And that brings me sort of to the general um, sort of physics to approach active the gels um, as they appear in, in cells as a, as a physical system, as a complex active material. Um, so we can think of this as a gel-like network, but it's not an elastic um, um, permanently cross-linked system, it is dynamic. And that's because filaments turn over. So filaments can polymerize by adding monomers at the ends. They can depolymerize. They have two different ends and they often treadmill in the sense that one end grows, one end shrinks. And overall the filaments are all, all the time renewed. It takes about 30 seconds to renew one of these filaments. And therefore this network is beyond the time scale of about 30 seconds or the minute time scale, it becomes a fluid because it's not permanently cross-linked. But there are cross-links. Um, some proteins form temporary cross-links and there are also motor molecules. Um, the myosin motors I indicated already, they can interact with filaments, um, consume a chemical fuel, which is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Um, this fuel is hydrolyzed in a reaction with water, giving rise to a diphosphate and inorganic phosphate. This is fuel then is associated with the chemical free energy um, of the reaction, which associates the difference in chemical potentials of fuel and products. Um, and this is the chemical driving force for the motor that can move along filaments against forces. Now, important here is the filaments are polarized, structurally polar. Um, so these actin filaments have two different ends. Um, monomers which form the filament structure are asymmetric molecules. So in motors that inter interact with the filaments um, feel an asymmetric substrate. And this then provides the motor with a directionality motion and force generation. Now motors can come as complexes, small assemblies, and can therefore cross-link filaments, and this provides the activity to this gel-like material. So we now have a material, um, a complex fluid um, that is coupled to chemistry, and is a important example of an active material of active matter.
Now, um, the simplest sorry, idea to think. Yes, that's sorry, a question. Can I, can I ask questions? Is, is that okay? Sure. I was just asking, so you, you said that the attachment detachment of the motor to the filament is a dynamic uh, process. What is it that controls this? So if you just purify motors and filaments, they can operate in a self-organized way without any control. So the motors themselves have the ability to run if they have fuel. But now there are also biochemical controls of motors. So the motor molecule can be activated or inactivated. And that is a level of complexity that allows for biochemical control on top of the fact that it's just a motor that does its job. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Thank you. Now, starting from a picture of a physical gel with temporary crosslinks, we have a soft material. Um, what the motor crosslinks essentially do is to introduce forced dipoles. Um, because when the motor holds on one side, it will create an equal opposite counter force on the other side, but then we have a complex of motors. Always exerts a pair of forces in the, in the gel. And that's of course because of force balance, since these are only internal forces, such forces can only come in pairs. And because they can act over a small distance, um, these forces introduce this dipole, um, which has an orientation. So the force dipole is a tensorial object um, that can be characterized as a point stress in the material. So P alpha is the vector giving the direction of one of these forces. Um, as a dipole, we have a P square entering here, so it's, it doesn't have a vectorial symmetry, it has a tensorial symmetry. Um, the delta function implies that in the coarse grain continuum limit, it acts at a location in space, and its magnitude is force times distance, so it's a unit of energy. Um, the delta function um, has units of one over volume, because if you integrate over volume over the delta function, you get a number one. So this gives you an energy per volume, which is a unit of stress. So this is a stress tensor introduced at a particular position in the material when the force dipole acts, yes? Yeah, so when you have plotted the force dipole in that picture, so do they all point to the same molecular motor or are they different molecular motors? So the force dipole is a abstract simplified picture of what the um, cross-link that is active does. Right. And the molecular motor complex is a physical realization of such an active crosslink. So, so if I have to have a physical picture in mind for intuitive purposes, so yeah. is that the, like the one in the bottom right, is that a good picture to have? So that would be an example of a force dipole, yes. Okay, so, and then one of and the then you would have one, be... one force acts here, one force acts here. Okay. So equal opposite, yes. Okay. Yes. Of course, if you start to build a molecular picture or model of this process, it is quite complex. Yeah? Um, the, the idea is that if you now coarse grain and you only look at what remains at larger scales without taking all the details into account, then the net effect of this is a force dipole. So th that also means now if you coarse grain, it is the spatial density of these forced dipoles, which generates the active stress. The active stress is a coarse grained concept that emerges for a large number of such forced dipoles. Now, each individual forced dipole has a pneumatic symmetry, it has an axis along which it acts. And now, if all these forced dipoles are aligned, or if they are average aligned um, in, in a system that is anisotropic, then you get a net active shear stress in this material. If these force dipoles in an isotropic material are randomly oriented, then the anisotropy averages away and you end up with an isotropic active stress. Now, in an incompressible system, an isotropic active stress has, a li has little effect because it cannot really compress material, while anisotropic active stresses are more dramatic because they 
generate shear. And as we'll see later, if you have surfaces, they also provide an anisotropy because there's a difference between the direction normal to the surface and tangential to the surface. So surfaces, active surfaces are naturally creating anisotropic um, active stresses. Now, this, as I mentioned already, the concept of the force dipole um, is an idea that you use when you take a coarse-grained approach, when you get rid of many of the irrelevant microscopic details and come up with an effective hydrodynamic picture on large scales or the slow modes of the system as Sriram um, yesterday um, very nicely introduced in his lecture. And so here you see a similar picture. Now I'm taking the coarse grain point of view and approach the system in a continuum manner um, without capturing details. And what is really key on the coarse grain level are the conservation laws, because they can not be destroyed by coarse graining. They are always there. Um, so the variables that are conserved are the most important variables for the slow dynamics of the system, and they are um, energy, mass, momentum, which are, which are all conserved. Um, so these conservation laws can be written, these balance equations, continuity equation, but we have density of a conserved quantity, we have fluxes. We have an energy flux, we have a mass uh, flux, and we have a momentum flux, which is stress tensor. Um, and you can see here also that in, in, a, in a steady state or in situations where inertial forces um, are important, that the conservation laws essentially imply the divergence of some flux vanishes. Some, for example, the stress tensor has a zero divergence in force balance, um, which describes when the conservation of force balance conditions. This also defines um, this velocity V, the hydrodynamic flow velocity, which is the velocity of the center of mass of local volume elements um, via this mass balance equation. Now, um, to describe active matter, starting from conservation laws, um, I think as Sriram yesterday also explained very nicely, one has needs to find expressions for these currents in terms of the the state variables of the system. These are what is called the constitutive equations describing material properties. And one way to come to such constitutive material relations is to use thermodynamics as a conceptual framework using, so if the free energy of a system is known, all the equilibrium properties um, are defined, it can be calculated, and one can then go slightly out of equilibrium in the vicinity of an equilibrium state um, to describe the dynamics, which is still governed by thermodynamic variables. And an idea that analyzes this, that we can, when we have on large scales dynamics of a system, um, at small scales, um, we can still have local thermodynamic equilibrium, even though the system as a whole is not at equilibrium. So many fast degrees of freedoms locally equilibrate in a certain time scale, which provides us with local thermodynamic quantities. And um, in this spirit, um, one can define locally chemical potentials, one can define locally um, um, other equilibrium quant quantities, um, like the density of free energy, like the density of entropy, and then use um, thermodynamics uh, to come to the structure of the dynamic equations. The starting point here is the entropy production rate if the system is slightly out of equilibrium. Um, so the entropy also satisfies the balance equation. So the density of entropy changes as entropy flux. And, but, but entropy is not conserved because the system out of equilibrium will produce entropy. And this entropy source term here, the entropy reduction, according to the second law of thermodynamics, is positive. It's some, some, some physical constraint. The entropy um, um, flux itself uh, is related to the heat flux. And the heat flux is a part of the energy flux that you have in the energy conservation. 
one can think of the energy flux as a part of the energy um, that flows, which is associated with free energy and a part of the energy that flows that is associated with heat. Um, and the entropy flux is related to the heat flux. Now, um, one can write the entropy reduction as products of pairs of variables that are um, um, conjugate to each other. And they, their product corresponds to entropy reduction. A simple example would be force and velocity. Um, if you have a motor that works against the force, force times velocity is the work that you put into the motor. And it's also associated with the um, entropy reduction associated um, with this um, degree of freedom of motion. And in the context of such a material, we have here um, a number of pairs of conjugate variables that define entropy reduction. If the system is a fluid that can flow, um, what can generate entropy um, is if there are velocity gradients in the system. The velocity gradient is, is V alpha beta is a symmetrized tensor of gradients of percent of mass velocity. And um, if the system is incompressible, this is traceless and it describes shear flows. And if this is multiplied with the stress tensor, this is a work performed per volume in a fluid and associated with the local entropy production. Um, when we have diffusive processes where um, gradients of chemical potential um, drive diffusion fluxes of molecules, the um, conjugate pairs of other gradients of the chemical potential, which is the thermodynamic force that drives diffusion. And Ji is the diffusion flux in the center of mass reference frame. So it doesn't include convection, but it's just, it's just diffusion. If we have chemical reactions in our system, which is important because they drive motors, which can then couple to mechanics, um, the chemical free energy that drives the motor, which I introduce delta mu, is conjugate to the rate R. It's a chemical rate at which the motor fuel is consumed in the process. And finally, um, radians of temperature drive heat flows, and that is also a pair of conjugate variables in this sense. We want to comment uh, the reason why velocities themselves uh, don't appear here at only velocity gradients is that if you have a material in three dimensions and you, and you have it move at constant velocity in some lab frame, um, there is no dissipation because of Galilei invariance, you can always go to a reference frame that moves at constant velocity without changing the physics. There's no dissipation if you just move homogeneously at some velocity. But if in the material there are difference of velocity, that gives rise to, to, to dissipation. I have a question here. Yes. Uh, so how is this uh, overall chemical potential related to this individual chemical potentials? So these are individual chemical potentials and I is the index of a molecule. So if you have many different types of molecules, each molecule has a chemical potential and that is given by mu I. And delta mu is if I just single out a single chemical reaction here and this delta mu is now the reaction gives free energy of this particular reaction. And since I'm talking about motors and active gels in a cell, this is ATP, ADP hydrolysis, which I mentioned before. But one can, of course, add many reactions, and then for each reaction, you have such a term. Now, another comment is that at thermodynamic equilibrium, there is no entropy production. It means these terms are all zero. And if you look at these terms, they are the conjugate terms have the property that both terms of each pair must be zero at equilibrium. At equilibrium, there is no velocity gradient. You could have a constant velocity if you are in a reference frame where the system moves, but at equilibrium, there cannot be any velocity gradients. Um, sigma d, the index d, I'll come to that later, indicates 
the part of the stress that is different from equilibrium, it's the deviatory stress. So the equilibrium stress does not dissipate and sigma D is zero at equilibrium and there is some equilibrium stress that exists. Um, but the conjugate variable to V is only the part of the stress that does not dissipate and that is in the, the non-equilibrium stress. Gradient mu is zero at equilibrium because the equilibrium chemical potentials must be constant. And Ji is zero at equilibrium because there is no molecular net flux. Um, it, it, equilibrium chemistry is at equilibrium, which means the chemical free energy delta mu is zero, and there's no reaction happening on average R is zero as well. And at equilibrium, we have constant temperature and no heat flux. So the idea of irreversible thermodynamics is now to take this reference point of equilibrium where all these quantities are zero and in the vicinity of this point, one can expand uh, the physics to first order in these quantities and then also to higher order, but often one limits to, to the linear order. So these are the conjugate variables that are associated with this entropy reduction. And at equilibrium, they, the left-hand side is zero and the right-hand side is zero. And if the left-hand side now goes to non-zero in a sm small amount, it will be first order contribution to the right hand side. And this is the simplest form of a constitutive material relation that describes the properties of the material um, by a matrix, a linear response coefficient matrix between these numbers and these numbers. And um, thermodynamics does not specify the content of this matrix. It's really non equilibrium physics which does that. It's very hard to calculate these quantities starting from microscopic theories. There are some approaches that allow to do that, but often it's very convenient to just build this matrix from physical principles and introduce the coefficients as parameters of the physics that one can measure and, and that have a physical meaning in an experiment. Now the matrix can couple these different quantities. Phone is being um, can couple these different quantities, and this implies that, um, for example, the chemical reactions can couple to mechanics, which is what we are interested in when we look at active matter by these cross couplings coefficients of this matrix M. Now, the couplings um, are limited by symmetry because we have a tensor here, we have a vector, a gradient here, we have a scalar here, and this is not a vector. And when we couple vectors with scalars, we have to see how this is possible given the symmetries of a system. Um, for example, when we have anisotropies in the system, which defines as a vectorial asymmetry or a tensorial asymmetry, that can allow us to couple scalar to a vector or a tensor. So the symmetries are key together with the nature of these quantities. And just to highlight the simplest example of that in the context of active gels, uh, when we now write this theory, we have a coupling from the velocity gradient to stress. And the coefficient that we introduce that's a diagonal element of our matrix is the viscosity. In the case of an incompressible system, we just have the shear viscosity. But we can also have a cross coupling term that couples, couples the chemical reaction driven by delta mu to the mechanical uh, quantities, to the stress, if the system is anisotropic. That's what I illustrated before. If we have an anisotropic material, then the force dipoles on average uh, are not random and there is a net shear. Um, stress, and it is now captured by this um, coupling, which is allowed if we have an anisotropy described by a vector P. Since I have to couple to a tensor, I can use P alpha, P beta to build a tensor. Um, and the coefficient, the unknown phenomenological coefficient is here called zeta, this describes the strength of this coupling. And this is now a macroscopic description. So this now captures the net orientation and strength of the force dipoles. Um, um, they're proportional to delta mu because they're in linear order away from equilibrium and they are characterized by a coefficient zeta, which describes 
um, the effect. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Why are you taking only the symmetric part of the alpha beta? The symmetric part of what? Of the alpha beta. But it comes out from the um, derivation of entropy production. And you're asking here so a question which has lots of subtleties if we go to the details. Um, if you, so you, can, you can separate out the symmetric and the anti-symmetric part of the velocity gradient. And the symmetric part couples with the symmetric part of the stress. The anti-symmetric part formally is multiplied with the anti-symmetric part of the stress. Um, now, one point is that if you have a system that rotates with a constant rotation rate, you can think of a material in a bucket of, of material on a rotating table, and you let it rotate for a long time, the system will go to a rotating state, which is an equilibrium state, which does not dissipate. And so you see from that that the anti-symmetric part of the velocity field at equilibrium can be non-zero, but does not dissipate. And if you do the, do the full derivation of the entropy reduction, you, 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 you find the proper arguments of what happens to the anti-symmetric part of the velocity gradient. And it gets a little bit more complicated in anisotropic systems like liquid crystals. We can discuss it in the details of that. But in a simple fluid, the stress anyway is a symmetric. There is no anti-symmetric part. And that's the uh, only dissipation that, that you find. But it's a good question. It's a very subtle point if you go deep into it. No questions? Yes. yes. Yeah. So uh, I have more of a philosophical question. So, in, so you're basically expanding up to linear order about equilibrium point. My question is like uh, how far you can apply this formalism. So let's say when you're using a highly active system. I kind of give you a general answer to that. Um, of course, you can, you can always add higher order terms if you want to. Um, it's also, this approach is linear only if, if written like this in the um, thermodynamic forces. You typically have nonlinearities in this matrix M because you're expanding around the reference state. And if you go from one reference state to a different reference state, you're changing M. And the sort of the dependence of M on the state is a nonlinearity non that is taken into account here. Um, my answer would be um, as long as this works, you use it. And if it doesn't work, you have to do something more. Doesn't doesn't work for everything, but it's extremely useful and powerful. In particular, also if you look at biological problems, you have often do very good approximation local equilibrium, and, and um, the non-equilibrium happens collectively on the mesoscale and not on the molecular scale. So in that sense, in that sense, um, um, it's quite powerful. Molecular scale description and not a macroscopic description. Oh, it's macroscopic. It's macroscopic. Okay. Okay. It's coarse grained. Yeah, the moment I have a continuum description, I do not see any molecules physically anymore. I only have coarse grained densities. Yeah? But, but the uh, principle originates from the idea that you have a local equilibrium somewhere, you know, in small scales. That's why you can define chemical potentials locally. Even, even in a diffusion process, chemical potentials have a gradient, you know, but locally, you can still define, you can locally define temperatures, you can measure temperatures also. And, and based on that, you have equilibrium concepts to a very good approximation at your disposal. But I'm not saying this always works. I'm just saying it's very, very powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now this um, is, is sort of a typical consequence of active coupling reactivity in systems which have motors cross-linking filaments. Another um, obvious consequence is that you can get active transport. So the simple transport equation would be the gradients of chemical potential by fluxes, which is diffusion. If you have high concentration here, low concentration there, you will have a diffusive flux, A to B. That is the diagonal term of the matrix M 
with the gradients of mu. Um, but now the active system, if this, it is locally anisotropic, and of course filaments provide the directionality as I mentioned earlier, um, they, I can couple the scalar delta mu to the vector j using p as a coefficient lambda. And now this implies even the absence of a gradient of mu, there can be a flux, and that is the flux generated by the motors. So this illustrates how this concept of cross coupling terms allows to describe all these phenomena in the active system um, that we're interested in a, in a living, living cell. We have the active transport, we have the active stress. I all outlined already that the active stress is most interesting when it's anisotropic. Um, so, when, for example, you have a bundle of filaments, um, then we can have an active stress that has no trace, that defines an axis, for example, of contraction and then a plane of expansion or vice versa. Now, I mentioned already that we're dealing in cells typically with surfaces that are active. So we have a thin layer of the material below the cell membrane. And um, we have a sheet, a thin film of activity. Um, now we can start conceptually from a three-dimensional material and then look at the properties of a thin film, of thickness D. Um, and we can now integrate the three-dimensional stress tensor over the thickness to define a two-dimensional in-plane tension of the sheet, of the film. And while this was a three-dimensional tensor, this is now a two-dimensional tensor. I also mentioned that um, surfaces are inherently anisotropic. So there is a, there is a direction perpendicular to the uh, surface or in the direction of the surface normal that is different from the rest. For example, we can often think of filaments being polymerized near the surface, near the membrane, and then grow away from it. And you get a typical filament orientation that is normal to the surface. Which means in three dimensions, you have an anisotropic active stress. Now, in the plane, if, if these filaments are really perpendicular, in the plane, we will have a 2D isotropic stress, but in 3D, it's an anisotropic stress. And this 2D isotropic active stress would be T active, um, denoted here. Now, if these filaments also tilt, um, are not purely normal, but also tilt, then there could be a contribution also in the plane of the surface. And I will focus for simplicity on the case where we have in 2D in isotropic active stress. Um, and now, um, um, in this effective 2D description, we can have a situation where we now balance um, viscous forces by the viscosity, bulk and shear viscosity in two dimensions um, with forces stemming from gradients of these active stress. So if you write force balances, they include the active stress. That's why we now get the force balance between gradients of active tension in this case with the shear forces. And here also introduced the friction term that is motivated by um, the system I showed you at the beginning, which is the embryo that generates surface flows, and it has an eggshell, and the flows are relative to the solid eggshell. Um, and this allows for such a friction term. Um, yeah, so the force balance um, equation for the, in the surface then gives rise to this flow equation depending on active stresses. So this is an illustration of the geometry when you have a thin um, cortical layer of active fluid below the membrane. One can measure the properties of this cortical surface layer, for example, using AFM, that's particularly done by Elisabeth Friedrich Fischer in Dresden. So he uses um, AFM cantilevers, which does a geometry to pull down on cells um, she can show, so she can, she can measure the cell shape, she can measure the surface area where the force is applied, she can measure the force that she applies, and she can um, look at the relative role of the surface mechanics and the bulk mechanics in the experiment. And, and in many cases, you can, if you neglect the contribution 
from the bulk because the cortical mechanics dominates the cell material mechanical properties when you deform it because the cell surface is really what, what governs the mechanical stability of the shell. That's what the cortex is good for. Um, now we can do really rheology by using temporal oscillations. Um, um, when, when de deforming the cell um, and then measure um, time dependent and um, sort of um, stationary material properties. Um, now the active tension now appears something like a cell surface tension. So the cell behaves as if it has a surface tension and this surface tension is not like a liquid droplet a thermodynamic property of the cell. It is generated by the actomyosin, which can be shown by perturbing the system. Um, and one finds values of millinewtons per meter, the value of the tension of the cell. Um, one also finds an elastic modulus. Because at short times, um, crosslinks are stable and filaments are stable. So if you look at, at response to fast deformations, you see an elastic response, so an elastic modulus, but then this elastic stress relaxes away because as I mentioned already, there's turnover of filaments, cross links are not permanent. And this, in this experiment, is only about 13 seconds that you see that elastic stresses relax away. The system becomes beyond this time scale, a viscous fluid, this viscoelastic below is viscous, long time scales with a viscosity that can be measured. And that's then corresponds to a constitutive equation uh, where the 2D tension uh, has these um, viscous terms and has the tension term. And this can be applied um, to the dynamics um, in a cell. So here you see an experimental observation of myosin, that is the motor is fluorescent, so that we have observed its densi the density and its, its motion. This is done in a microscopy where one focuses on the surface of the cell to really see the cell cortex. Um, one can average um, across uh, the vertical, the second uh, direction um, to get a profile along the axis of the cell and then using many experiments to get good statistics. Um, one can measure profiles of the flow velocity in the X, the X component and the density of motors as a function of position, um, which is somehow a readout, a proxy for the active stress. And here you see data. Um, so it is a velocity profile, events on position, these are, these are just the axis along the long axis of the cell. This is the profile of the motor distribution. And now one can use this simple model to see whether the two are related in the way I, I described. So I'm using as a simple model that the second derivative of the flow, that's the viscosity, that's, that's the hydrodynamic equation, one dimension, including the friction term, and this is the gradient of the active stress. And the idea now is that the active stress may be proportional to the concentration of the motors. So one can take the measured profile of the motor distribution in as a, as a, as a source term in this equation and then calculate the, the velocity profile. And there you have essentially two fit parameters. One is the length scale, the ratio of those two, viscosity and friction define a length scale um, and then there's the unknown factor between um, concentration and actual tension generated, the amplitude of the stress. Um, the, the, but since the motor concentration is always measured in arbitrary units, there's nothing, no real parameter there. So there's only one fit parameter. And this single fit parameter is now used to fit the velocity function calculated, which is the red curve. The, to, the, to the data. Um, and this, from this one finds that this characteristic length scale is 15 micrometers in the cell. 
Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, why is it that the low concentration motor leads to a higher velocity? Uh, so the the gradients of the motor um, distribution is what really drives the flow. You know? So it's it's where you have the strong gradient that you generate a lot of flow. That's what this equation tells you, and that's what what you see in the in the data. Just to give you a bit more of an idea of, uh, of what a very simple but naive 1D model means, um, the, the idea is that the material in three dimension is compressible, it's incompressible. So the divergence of the three dimensional flow field is, is zero, but we can have in the two dimensional surface a compressible flow. Now, if we have such a compressible flow that the velocity moves in to some region, then the material would accumulate here. And the idea is now that the thickness of the film is set by some process that film itself turns over and there's a process which sets the preferred thickness. So there's a polymerization, for example, polymerization velocity of filaments and there's a lifetime of filaments and it sets a length scale. And so if, this is, if we look at slower love processes, then we can think of the thickness be constant, so the material that is accumulated here will, be, will leave in the third dimension, will depolymerize and go to the inside of the cell. We have a three-dimensional incompressibility, but in two dimensions, we have a divergence of the flow, which means that there is a, a velocity Vz as a boundary condition, the normal direction, um, which is related to the thickness and the divergence in two dimensions. So 3D incompressible, 2D compressible. That's why we just have, have a fourth shear and about viscosity in the 2D flow. Now this, um, in this picture now, um, one can look at a simple case that relates also to the question you just had. Um, to get an idea of what this equation does, one can look at a jump in active tension. And that's roughly what happens if you have two domains um, in, the, in the par proteins. Um, which may control different active tensions. At the domain boundary, there's a jump. And for such a jump in active tension, the resulting velocity profile, it's all, in this case, positive. You drive a flow from left to right, but the flow is maximal at the jump, um, and then it decays exponentially with characteristic length scale. That's the solution to this equation. Yeah? So whenever there is a change or a jump in active tension, you generate local flows, which reach out over a distance set by this hydrodynamic length, set by viscosity and friction. <clears throat> that may help you understand better the relationship between motor density and flow that was seen in this experiment. Now, um, just as a teaser, but I'll come back to later, looking at this experiment, one also finds that there are components in the second direction, not only along the long axis x, but in the direction of y, and that these components of the flow field break chiral symmetry. So it's very difficult to see by eye in these flows, but by averaging for many um, realizations and also in the, in the y direction, in addition to the x, vx profile, there's also a vy profile that there is, on the posterior side, there's upward motion, on the anterior side, there's downward motion, there's a counter rotation, um, which is not in a very simple model, which I described so far. Um, this is the picture of the counter rotation. In systems which are perturbed, one can uh, sort of uh, enhance these effects and make these chiral flows visible. So the system can regulate the strength of this chirality. We call it cell chirality. And it implies that um, the processes generating these forces in, in the active gel are chirally asymmetric and are able to generate chirally asymmetric flows. And this stems from the fact that molecules underlying the force generation are 
chiral, as all biomolecules are. And the force generating process therefore has chiral asymmetries. And this, in the context of a, of a um, um, eggshell, which is a solid on which the, the fluid moves, this allows from symmetry arguments a chirally asymmetric torque and anti symmetric contributions to the two dimensional uh, stress tensor. Um, and so here illustrate um, the symmetries. I outlined already the force dipole that you generate when you have a pair of opposing um, forces introduced by motors as crosslinkers. Now, if you look closely, filaments are chiral objects. They have a helical chirality, top of their polarity. And this means that there's not only motors not only generating linear translation when they act, the filaments also rotate. This can be also observed directly that you have, on a, you have motor, filaments moving on the carpet of motors, they glide and they rotate. And this then implies we don't only have a force dipole introduced in the material, we also have a torque dipole introduced. And these torque dipoles give rise to these, these torques um, and only exist if the underlying microscopic system has broken chiral symmetry. And then we have an additional term in this equation, in addition to the gradients of T driving um, flows along the cell axis where we have this polarity, we also drive flows in the opposite in the perpendicular direction. And in the simplest picture, the active torque is also proportional to the density of motors and the ratio between this torque and the tension uh, is a dimensionless parameter describing how much relative importance of force dipoles and torque dipoles in this, in this process. <clears throat> now we described the, so far the physics of the cell cortex as a prototype model system for active surfaces in biology. Um, and there were a number of principles that are outlined that one can discuss here. And if I course drain the picture, I get a very general hydrodynamic um, picture of an active thin film. If I now go to very different systems, such as a multicellular sheet of cells, epithelium, which I showed you before, this is also a two-dimensional active layer, which is close to being a, a fluid. Um, and there are also internal force generation, the internal active stresses. So the physics on, on a coarse grained level can be very similar to the physics of the cell cortex that I outlined. Um, and many of the principles apply also here. So the nice thing about the coarse grained picture is that the details um, that are often irrelevant um, disappear from view and the principles such as conservation laws, activity and so on are what is most striking and one can use very similar approaches and concepts to describe both types of systems before, even though they're totally different in their physical nature. Just as an example, I want to outline a few um, approaches to this tissue level. So we're not using exactly the same uh, models as for the, for the cell cortex, but there are lots of similarities. And in principle, one, one could for many problems actually use the same models. Now, one important difference for the, for the cell sheet is that the, the liquid approximation is much less useful approximation because viscoelasticity plays a much more important role. Often they are really elastic sheets. Um, so cells have to rearrange um, or there has to be a lot of cell division and cell death for this to become liquid. And um, to describe this crossover from, from elastic to liquid behavior, we are um, taking into account um, the fact that the um, velocity gradients, the shear in a tissue can be decomposed um, in sort of an elastic part, if you want, which is the rate of change of cell shape, which are elastic deformations um, of, the, of the cell in this point of view, and the contribution from cell rearrangements, which is then what, what fluidifies 
system. And then we write an elastic discontinuity equation for the cell stress, where Q is a tensor describing the anisotropies of the cell shape. So Q is zero of the cells are essentially yeah, not circular, but if they don't have a preferred allocation, allocation direction, and Q is a tensor that describes the stretch of cells along one axis if they are deformed. And in this continuum description, this is a coarse-grained property of a, a group of cells which are elongated in the same axis in, in, in a small patch. But it's a quantity that can be measured and observed, and that's also why we need it in our, in our approach. But then there can be active stress contributions. Um, on top of that, the rate R describes um, tissue shear flow due to cells rearranging, changing their neighborships in the tissue. Um, and that has its own constitutive material relation. It's an active term, and there's also a term associated with the fact that if um, there's a lot of stress, this will drive cell rearrangements. And um, an interesting feature of many tissues is that they have um, the kinosensitive feedbacks, that their properties can be regulated with, by mechanical stresses. And in this particular tissue, which is the early fly wing, um, we find that such a mechanosensitive mechano feedback is used to help build cell polarities in this tissue, cell anisotropies in this tissue. So Q is a, a cell, is a tensorial anisotropy of the cell, which is a biochemical anisotropy similar to the one that I showed you with the um, cell polarity before that had sort of, this was vectorial. You have domains in the cell surface define the asymmetry of the cell. Here we cannot see the vector direction, so we use a tensorial um, measure of, of cell polarity. And this has its own dynamic equation. Um, it wants to align between neighboring cells and there's a, um, there are terms that allow the system to, to um, describe its polar state, but it is not spontaneously generating polarity, but it is coupled to the stress by a mechanosensitive feedback. So cells respond in their chemical anisotropy to, to the local stress. And this system overall can be exhibited in an instability where it spontaneously polarizes. So we have a state where cells are isotropic and then depending on this mechanosensitive feedback, this becomes anisotropic. Um, and in anisotropic state, it will generate shear flow spontaneously because it's an active system. And this can, can account for the patterns of cell shape, and the orientation of cell rearrangements in these tissues that are observed and measured. Um, so that shows that in this level, we have some extra complexities that I didn't introduce in the simple model for the um, cell cortex, but it's another example of an active two-dimensional system, and it shows a little bit the, the rich possibilities that we have in these systems. On one hand, the continuum descriptions are very similar because the conservation laws and the basic principles are the same, but if you add some more details, you can get differences and you can get, get a quite rich set of, of phenomena. Now, so far, um, I haven't really worried very much about geometry of these surfaces. And the really interesting um, physics appears when surfaces are not flat, but curved, and also if they change their shape. That's somehow the, the real goal of this research on active surfaces to be able to use the insight and the physics of activity on surfaces to understand the shaping of biological surfaces. And just as an example, I'll show you here the epithelial um, folding and diversion. So if we look at the late pupil fly wing, it's actually very flat, as I've shown you. But if you look at earlier stages, and this is the so-called wing disc, that's the 
tissue that is in the larvae of the fly to prepare the tissue of the wing, to pattern the tissue, it will become the wing. And the pupa then somehow is really finalized. Um, in the early stages, it looks quite different from a wing. It is not flat. It has these bulges and it has these folds. You see a cross section. And then the later stage, the tissue is really changing its shape. It's reverting to go from this configuration to this configuration. And here, this is sort of a, it's an actual um, tissue observed under the microscope, which is then analyzed and, and segmented so that we can see the individual cell outlines. Um, it starts like this structure, and then there is a sudden process in which cells flow and the shape changes. There are also cell divisions happening here in, here in red. And at the end, we, we come to, to this geometry. So this happens that this part moves out um, and then stretches and becomes flat. So that's the, the flat sheet of the late fly wing, and that's the early structure that you see here. And one interesting problem here is to understand how active processes drive geometry changes. So we have now the, um, the setting that um, we have a lot of active processes taking place at surfaces, at interfaces in biological systems, both cells and tissues. Both epithelial tissues and the actomyosin to cortex are such active surfaces. They are also both somehow soft and fluid, fluidized, um, even though they may have some more complex properties as compared to a simple fluid. In the case of the epithelium, it's cell divisions and cell extrusions and cell deaths that fluidify the tissue. In the case of the cortex, it's the turnover of filaments. Um, in both cases, we get flows that are generated by the me mechanical activity of the cell cytoskeleton that drives force generation and that uses ATP as a fuel. Um, and we'd like, now like to develop a theory uh, for how to do act, this active material on a curved geometry with the goal to also describe the change of shape of this geometry. So with that, I come to the, this more conceptual part of my lectures. Um, and I first, want to uh, discuss a bit of basic differential geometry, which we need to describe shapes of surfaces, and then explain how to do the physics um, on curved surfaces, how to understand force balances and torque balances on curved surfaces, um, discuss a bit how to do the equilibrium of such shapes, and then do the non-equilibrium. Um, and I will use also a little bit of blackboard to discuss that. Um, <clears throat> and we'll switch a bit later to um, uh, unshare the screen and focus on the blackboard. But let's first start with a few basic concepts. Um, so in order to describe a curved surface geometry, um, so you think of this dashed thing indicating a curved two-dimensional manifold, in general, we use a parameterization um, of the position of a point on the surface as a function of two parameters, which I label here as one, as two, um, that are used in a physical description as a parameterization of the surface. And of course, in the physical properties, the choice of this parameterization should not matter because only the, the geometry that is independent of the choice is what matters. Um, but in the examples and the, and the notation I'm using, there will always be an underlying parameterization with the idea that changes in parameterization don't affect the physics. Now, um, we can introduce locally a reference frame. Um, in three dimensions, I would use a normal vector, which is normalized to one, and tangent vectors, which we find a tangent plane at a given point to the surface and can be used as a basis for this tangent plane. And they are just obtained 
by taking the derivative of x with respect to these two uh, parameters. And these um, basis vectors EI, they are in general not orthonormal because I can in general not choose a parameterization, which would be orthonormal everywhere. The surface is curved. Um, so I have to deal with non-normalized and non-orthogonal reference frames. And um, the non-orthonormality is, re is, is reflected in the fact that the scalar products EI and GJ, which define the metric tensor that allows me to define local geometry, um, is different from the unit matrix. Now I can express any vector field in three dimensions using my local base. So in the plane, I have the components VI using the base EI, and then I have a component VN um, in the normal direction. If I, for example, think of flow fields, then the VI components would describe the fluid flow in the plane of the surface, which is the vector in the tangent plane, and the Vn would describe a motion normal to the plane, which def describes shape changes of the surface. So if I can calculate this velocity field, I get information both for the flows in the surface as well as the shape changes. Um, now, in order to, to get there, I need to introduce a few concepts. Um, so I'm using the upper indices relative to this basis E lower I. One can also introduce a basis with the index. The upper index, a conjugate basis, defined such that the conjugate basis vectors and the vectors E I lower I are orthonormal to each other. And so I therefore have mixtures of, of, of um, um, components. I can use indices upper indices relative to EI and lower indices relative to the conjugate basis and to go from upper index quantities to lower index quantities. I need a metric tensor and I always have, if I have an upper and lower index of the same type, I always sum over it to avoid um, writing too many sums here. So this is a matrix multiplied with a vector giving a vector. Yeah, and these are the conjugate basis is defined such that these scalar products are delta ij, but this is a chronicle symbol. And the metric tensor has an inverse matrix to it, which is, which is the metric tensor with upper indices. So that defines me um, the quantities that I need locally to define vectors and to raise and lower indices. Um, now, an important concept is the curvature of this two-dimensional manifold. Um, and while the curvature of a line can be described sort of by scalar quantities, the curvature of a surface is a tensorial object. And the, sort of the easiest way to understand that is that um, so if I... Um, take the normal vector, that's the unit vector perpendicular to the surface, and I move along the surface, then the normal vector will change its orientation. And that's associated with curvature. So gradients of the normal vector sig signal curvature. The normal vector is a unit vector, so as it changes, it cannot change along its own direction, it can only change perpendicular, it can only rotate. And if the normal vector rotates, the change in n is always tangential to the surface. So that's why gradients of the normal vector um, can always be expressed using the tangential basis because there's no normal component. Now the normal, the normal vector can move in all sorts of directions when you move along a direction on your surface. And therefore, its change is characterized by this matrix Cij. So we sum over J. The gradient of n is expressed in terms of this basis. And the coefficients of this 
EIJ are the components of the curvature tensor. Now I can do the same One thing. Question. Yes. Yeah. So what is the difference between CIJ at the bottom and CI at bottom and J at top? Those two? Yeah. So those are both some kind of curvature. Yeah, tensor. so they, they, these are components of the same tensor. So maybe just um, illustrate this briefly. So I can think of there's one curvature tensor, um, which I can write in terms of its components. Let's say CIJ. You're not writing too high up here. E, I, E, J. So this will be a tensor basis using my, my tangent space. These are the components of the tensor, and this is sort of the abstract form of the tensor. And I can also write this as C, I, J, E, I, E, J, where I've used here the conjugate basis yeah, with the idea that E, I, J equals delta I J. And then the logic is that well, this ten, the curvature tensor is symmetric. It doesn't really matter which way I write those two. And then I have C I J equals um, C I K G K J. So I can use the metric tensor to raise and lower indices. This comes from this um, property of the conjugate basis. Really speaking, they are basically encode the same information. They describe the same information. So there's only one curvature tensor and there are different um, bases I can use to describe them and then I have different components. That's also why I now um, look at the same thing with the tangent vectors. So I should say, if I, um, if I calculate the normal derivative of my tangent vectors, now the tangent vectors are not normalized. So if they, they can change also along their direction and they can change in all other directions. So if I want to decompose this within my basis, I need all three vectors, n, e1, e2. So I can write this as the i, j, n plus coefficients describing the, um, So this is now decomposed um, in three dimensions. And it turns out that the um, components in normal direction is again the Turk curvature ten tensor. And the components in the plane, they are um, dependent on the choice of the parameterization I'm using. So they're not parameterization um, independent. And in order to go to a parameterization independent representation, I have to use a, what's called a covariant derivative. And that's what I denote with this symbol. And this is then just Cij. So if I use a covariant derivative, I get a covariant expression, which is independent of the choice of the parameterization. Um, and the similarity between this um, and the other relation Gradient n equals c i j j follows from the fact that the tangent vector and the normal vector are orthonormal to each other. So I have n times e i is zero. Therefore, also the gradient of this is zero. And if I write this out, I get EJN times EI plus N gradient JEI. So this here, um, I can now use this expression here. The scalar product of the basis vectors gives me the matrix tensor. So I get C. J, K, G, K, I. This here, um, I can use this. N is normalized, N times M is one. 
So I get here just minus C I J equals zero. And then you see the relationship between the matrix with lower indices and this matrix where we lower the second index with the metric tensor G. Another important quantity is um, I already mentioned a normal vector, which I can write as E1 vector E2 normalized. And um, what is also relevant later is the totally anti-symmetric tensor in two dimensions. Um, which can be defined um, as the times n. Um, which is a true tensor, so which means it is independent of the parameterization chosen. And from the curvature tensor, we can build um, two scalars, curvature scalars. One is the um, mean curvature, which is um, defined as one half of the trace of the curvature tensor. And for to do the trace, I have to raise one index so that I can sum over uh, two equal upper and lower indices. Now the trace of the curvature tensor is also the sum of the two eigenvalues of the curvature tensor. And the eigenvalues are called principal curvatures and the associated eigenvectors are the directions on the surface along which these principal curvatures um, somehow uh, occur. Now a second scalar is the Gaussian curvature, which is the de determinant of the curvature tensor. And I have to use here this matrix Cij with one upper and one lower index yeah, to calculate the, term, the trace. Um, so there's also the product of the two principal curvatures. Um, and those two describe the type of local geometry on the surface that is curved. Now, um, I've already introduced the covariant derivatives, which we need when we take derivatives of vectors and tensors um, in the tension plane of the surface to generate um, um, derivatives that are independent of the parameterization um, chosen. And then one important property of covariant derivatives is that they don't commute, which is very, which, very but it's, when it's not used to when coming from flat um, geometries. Um, so usually you can think of just exchanging derivatives and you have the symmetries there. But if I take, for example, a vector um, for, for a scalar, the covariant and the normal difference the, the derivative doesn't make a difference. For a vector, it, might, it makes a difference. So if I take a vector and I calculate a second derivative, um, I have a possibility I just take a divergence with one index, I take a divergence of the vector and then have another gradient. And here I take first the gradient, then the divergence, and the two are not the same. And the difference is related to Gaussian curvature. And this um, becomes really apparent when one calculates the divergences of the stress tensor. And this happens all the time, and one has to take this into account carefully. Um, so yeah, there are a couple of minutes left, so I will just do a few more basic things and then I'll wrap up for today. And tomorrow I will continue with the meat of these concepts. Um, so we can now think about how to do a force balance on a curved surface. So I have a manifold that is curved. Uh, we have internal stresses, we have external forces. And I mentioned already earlier that force balance corresponds to the divergence of a stress being zero if you have a steady state, if you don't worry about inertia. And here's the equivalent of that. If we have a forces acting on the surface, um, then they have to be balanced by the forces acting at any uh, boundary line. So if you, if you want to have force balance. 
we can take an arbitrary boundary line here and then sum up all the force vectors that act on the surface. And if we then also sum up all the forces that act on the boundary, the sum of everything must be zero. It's required by force balance. This is a surface integral, this is a boundary integral. The, the mu i is a unit vector normal to the boundary but tangential to the surface. And ti is the boundary force. And sort of using Gauss theorem for a curved manifold, this implies that the divergence of this, um, if you think of this thing as, a, as existing everywhere, the divergence of this ti must be the fx. That's, that now describes lo locally the force balance described globally here. Now, the, this here looks like divergence of a stress being the force, which we saw in three dimensions before. But now, by in three dimensions, the stress tensor is a three by three matrix. This stress is a, is a vector with an index. So the, you could think of the vector T is a, is, a, is a vector in three dimensions as a three, three component index, X, Y, Z, while the I is a two component index describing a plane, tangential plane of the surface. So this is a three by two matrix, if you want. It's because we're having a two dimensional world coupled to the three dimensional world. And so that's why I'm writing it here as a vector with index i. And um, this ti is what replaces the stress for a surface. I can use my local coordinate system to decompose it in a matrix tij in the j direction and a tin in the normal direction. And tij is what, similar to what I described before, is an in-plane tension tensor. The tin is something more complicated, some shear stress which couples the plane to the third dimension and we all need to work balance to understand what tin is. But this we'll do tomorrow. So I think I'll wrap up for today. And then I will start with these force and torque balances tomorrow and build a theory of active surfaces. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Hello. So this looks like the integral and differential form of the Gauss law. Uh, What's the question? Um, no, this looks like the integral and differential form of the Gauss law. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it similar or I mean? Exactly. There is, using, yeah, if you use covariant derivatives, you can derive Gauss law for the curved surface, yes. Thank you. Uh, so while you're describing the active torques, you mentioned that they are proportional to the concentration. Uh, I mean, it's not clear how it is. Yeah, um, of course, um, we don't know the details about the active torques. We only see this effective picture in the experiments, but somehow it's associated with actomyosin interactions. And it seems also as if some molecules such as formin play an important role, and that the cell can regulate the importance of these torques by, by controlling other molecules than actin myosin. Um, but because myosin is the force generator, it is also the torque generator, even though there may be other, other components involved. And um, that's why in the simple picture, we just make the simple picture that the Myosin concentration is proportional to the active stress, also proportional to the active torque. And this simple assumption is consistent with the data. I don't know more than that. I mean, this is derived from the observation. From the observation, yes. Mm -hmm. And you. also the fact that myosin is proportional to the active stress is also not trivial. It's some sort of good luck. Yeah? It's also not exact because myosin are regulated and they can be switched on and off and we can in the experiment not distinguish active from inactive myosins. And of course, in practice, the total concentration and the active concentration is not directly proportional, but it seems to be close, at least within the 
precision of, of the measurements. Yeah. And then there are huge uncertainties, not very precise the numbers that we can actually measure because it's so variable. Um, and there are lots of fluctuations when there's an average or lot. Uh, uh, it's a bit of a naive question. So, uh, so the way you're having this active gel uh, model is basically there are some contractile fibers which are being pulled by a motor or like some other moieties. Uh, so in, uh, in theory, it should also work for when cells kind of contract the collagen gels and stuff. People usually use a continuum model. Do you think like this is uh, the same framework of the different length scale can also predict like cell crawling through a uh, 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 ECM gel kind of situation? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly which situation you have in mind, but I think in general continuum approaches are very powerful and useful. Um, and they often work well, even when you already see the fact that there's some discrete structure, structure underlying it. So okay. I think continuum models are extremely efficient to use, to be used. But of course, they're always wrong because they're always describing something which on small scales is different. Um, but I think it's the first thing to use just because um, of their simplicity and their elegance and, and um, and they seem to work better than, than you might expect. I'm not sure if that answers the I question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, here we are in this part, like force balance on curved surfaces. We are just considering a stationary surface. Like we are not considering any shape change or expansion of the surface. Oh, the, we have all the freedom here to do what we want. Um, so we'll do both. I'll first. Uh, start simple by applying external forces that exactly balance whatever tries to change the shape so that we can work with a fixed geometry and then later I will let it free and then it can evolve. And then, as I mentioned before, if I'm able to calculate a three dimensional velocity vector, I get both the in plane flows and the shape changes. So uh, you showed that the surface tension value of a cell, so that will be different during different stages of cell division, right? Uh, when you showed that the AFMT path used to measure the cell surface tension. Yes. So does that correspond to a particular cell stage? Yes, so the cell surface tension can vary. The cell can control it. The cell divides, it will actually increase the cell surface tension. And that's why dividing cells often, often become spherical, become spheres in the tissue that has non-spherical cells. It pushes the neighbors a bit so that it can take spherical shape. That's because it increases its surface tension. And after division, it reduces the surface tension again. It has a relaxed shape that fits in the neighbors. So the surface tension is not a fixed value, but the value I showed you is from my point of view, sort of an order of magnitude. If you want to have an idea of Roughly what the order of magnitudes are, you can use such a value, but in practice, it will vary. Okay, yeah. But I thought that uh, when the cell divides, it becomes more fluidy. So then the tension value should go down. When, when you observe a cell dividing the tissues, I've shown you a movie of the fly wing, and you see when cells divide, if normal the cells have these polygonal shapes, and then when they divide, suddenly they become circles. And you also they look larger in the movie. So you see them, these dark, dark circles appearing and then disappearing. That's division. That is because the cell increases surface tension and becomes a sphere. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> 